From Microbe TV, this is Matters Microbial, a podcast about the wonders of microbiology, microbiologists, and microbial centrism. This episode was recorded on November 20th, 2023. Hello, Micronauts, and welcome to today's Quality Quorum. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Martin, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Today is the 17th episode of Matters Microbial, and I so appreciate every view, every rating, every comment, every listen. Thank you all so very much. First, a denizen of my Wunderkammer, a tiny fragment of the erg Check 2 meteorite, which originated in a protoplanet that formed before the Earth itself. Just think on that. I put a link to this amazing meteorite in the show notes. Next, as I am an inveterate microbial centrist, please look at this beautiful cross-stitched item bearing a motto that the late, great Abigail Salyers and I came up with many, many years ago about the microbial world. First evolved, last extinct. Finally, a comment that I received on the YouTube channel expressing wonder at how important microbes are on the planet. Here's a screen grab of those comments. In the show notes, I'll give links to a paper written by former podcast guest Dr. Jack Gilbert about a, quote, world without microbes. In addition, I will also provide a link to a video that Jack and the fabulous science writer Ed Young created several years ago on the subject, and here is a screen grab of that presentation. They are well worth your time. I have long been interested in the intersection between microbes and evolution. I'm putting a link to a wonderful review of the work of the great Rich Lensky in the show notes. I often tell my students that the hand of Darwin is on all that lives. Here you can see that my artist friend Rachel Webster created this fine illustration of the concept. A few years ago, I became interested in how evolution occurs in bacteria and found some remarkable work by today's podcast guest, Dr. Von Cooper of the University of Pittsburgh, on this topic. I was able to have students show how bacteria can adapt to changing conditions as seen in this photograph that I took of colony variants. The artist, Liza van der Art, even created a wonderful image for a related course I taught with the motto, Evolutioners Assemble. So, you can imagine my excitement to welcome Dr. Von Cooper of the University of Pittsburgh to this podcast to tell us a bit about teaching evolution to high school and undergraduate students using this fabulous microbial system. Welcome to our Quality Quorum, Von. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Mark. It's a huge pleasure. Do you think you could just take a moment and talk a little bit about your background for the listeners and viewers? Sure. Uh, so uh, the story I always say is that when I got to college, I was pretty sure that I wanted to study biology. Um, I, I was a, a fisherman and uh, really loved being outdoors and uh, was able to take a field ecology course my very first semester where we did mark recapture experiments in a in a local pond and i thought that that would be a great place to do my undergraduate research at amherst college um, and then uh, when i began to pitch that to my uh, undergrad advisor paul hewald he said that sounds great but uh, it would take seven or eight undergrad careers to get enough data to write up and he said let me let me let me share this other experiment that we have ongoing with uh, this insect virus and its evolution. Uh, now, this insect virus uh, killed gypsy moth caterpillars, which were a big problem back in New England at the time. You know, they deforest, um, uh, you know, eat a lot of uh, leaves and and deforest the the local uh, uh, township community forests and so on, and uh, 
And he said, well, we, we, can, we can actually grow these in real time and see changes, we think, in these virus populations. And we set out an experiment to vary how the virus transmitted. And so we had the idea that rapid replicating viruses might be selected if you transmit from insect to insect early in the infection. And then at the other, in another treatment, we would transmit late. And we would uh, ideally, we hypothesize, would be transmitting late viruses. So I had a hand in those experiments, and then we analyzed them after the fact. And sure enough, the early transmitted viruses became more virulent. They killed more insects. And then we also discovered a really interesting trade-off. And so, you know, insect caterpillars, they're um, growing and, and as, as they're being infected. And so they're getting bigger. And the way this insect transmits is actually by liquefying the entire larvae and making more viruses. So bigger hosts make more viruses. And so just to draw this out, if you are a sort of more patient virus and you kill your host later, you're killing a bigger host. So you're actually making more virus. Whereas the fast replicating viruses, they get out of their uh, insects earlier, so they can maybe increase their rate of transmission or transmit to a new insect sooner. And so it sets up this trade-off that where the, if the insects are really dense, it's better to be fast because you can get out and transmit and kill more the next insect to make more of yourself. But if they're scarce, it's better to be sort of patient and transmit later. That all came from one series of experiments from my undergraduate thesis. It involved an evolution experiment with microbes. We started that back in, what, 1992 or 93. And I have basically been hooked with microbial evolution ever since. That is an amazing story. I'm very lucky. Uh, do, these hap <laughs> do these happen to be, well, I've never met Dr. Ewell, yeah. but I, 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 he, he was fabulous and I've read everything. Great. Any, anyway. What I was going to say to you, do these happen to be baculoviruses? They are. They are baculoviruses. And what's great about them, as you probably know, is that they make these um, big inclusion bodies that are lots of viruses uh, bundled up in protein. And so they're visible under low power microscopy to clumsy undergraduates like me. So it really, <laughs> it's like a great, uh, it was a great study system to get going. Oh yeah, I'm I I I need a, a German word for being jealous and pleased all at the same yeah, time. Right? Yeah. right. It was an, I mean, all of you've probably heard lots of stories about serendipity uh, in science, and uh, this is yet another one. Right? I I would not have thought I would be doing this kind of work uh, were it not for that experience. So I hear echoes of this not only from your interest in infectious disease obviously, yeah. but also in the project that you're going to be discussing with people today. Yep. So I think it all comes together quite well. Yep. Would you care to set the stage? Sure. So yeah, I mean, I'm grateful for the, the, the uh, invitation to, to talk about our evolution experiments that we deliver in high school classrooms called Evolving STEM. That's the name of the program. And you can find out more about that at our website, evolvingstem.org. Um, but it it really began. Um, uh, its origin was when I was working in Rich Lensky's lab as a PhD student, which you also made reference to. And I did some early competition experiments, as you do as a as a new sort of new student in the lab. And we could see changes in frequency just in over the course of really an overnight passage. You mix mutant versus wild type, or even mutant versus evolved mutant versus evolved mutant. And you could see a change in their frequencies based on a marker on their, uh, the, the marker that they, they make on their, uh, for their um, colonies. So, so more red relative to pink or more pink relative to red in real time. And it just seems so captivating that somehow, some way, everybody should learn evolution doing an experiment like this. That's something that I'm very, very interested in doing myself, because now we have the tools, thanks to you, by the way, 
um, to look at any number of systems. But, you know, that's the old joke. Think of it as evolution in action because it kind of is. It is. And, and what I love so much is everyone – it's like the weather. Everyone talks about evolution. No one does anything about it. But that's no longer true. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, it's inevitable, right? And, but, you know, I think that the challenge is to make it tangible. And so with that set of observations – um, I started to riff on experiments that students might be able to appreciate, but it became pretty clear that changes in frequencies of, say, colors was not as maybe captivating as some other phenotypes. And so as a postdoc, I started working um, on pathogens of cystic fibrosis. And we were focusing on, rather than pseudomonas, which is a, a more commonly studied pathogen of persons who have the genetic disorder cystic fibrosis. Um, we were studying another bacteria called Burkholderia, Burkholderia cepatia complex, which is a mouthful. These are also particularly threatening for persons who have cystic fibrosis, and they can um, cause life-threatening disease. We were interested in how those were evolving in chronic airway infections of persons with CF. And we noticed pretty clearly that, um, that over time, isolates from sputum samples from those patients would change in their appearance. And so I began to, to model that, um, try to figure out how to study that more reproducibly in the lab. And um, when I wound up starting my own lab at the University of New Hampshire some years later, uh, I uh, was trying to come up with a way of studying uh, their evolution on surfaces, because we knew that uh, patient airways are surfaces. They often are infected from probably surface-borne microbes. And uh, when bacteria are on surface, they form biofilms. They will secrete surface, secrete compounds that allow them to bind themselves and to one another. Uh, on those surfaces, and we predicted that that would be a, a key part of their potential diversification. So the broader hypothesis that we were testing as researchers was, is uh, evolution in biofilms noticeably different? Is it different in its dynamics, and is it different in the kinds of traits that are selected? So I had this terrific early PhD student named Stefan Poltak, who came up with an idea of, let's just put a plastic bead in a test tube. So whereas back in the Lenski lab, we were doing serial dilutions, just one to 100 dilutions of liquid into a fresh tube of liquid media. Here, the dilution is a plastic bead that's being moved from test tube to test tube. And then we thought, well, you can't just have one bead. You actually need another bead so that you can compete that cycle. Otherwise, you'd just be moving one bead over and over again. So the innovation is simply you have a bead on which the bacteria must grow because you move that bead to a new tube. And then there's a new bead in that new tube that those bacteria must now colonize. And so it selects for this cycle of attachment, dispersal, recolonization every day which is really handy for really anyone. So it's, I joke, it's great for sort of the graduate student life cycle, but it's actually, as it turns out, great for all students because they can do a simple transfer every day and test some of these processes. And so very early on, just to, to sort of cut this short, uh, just a few weeks into Stefan's first experiments, he, he observed that those Burkholderia had conspicuously diversified. So not only had they, were they producing more biofilm on the tubes, when you plated the, them out to single, co single level of single colonies, those colonies were no longer uniform and they weren't just, had not changed in one way, they had changed in multiple ways. So one smooth ancestor had diversified into three different types, which we called studded, studded ruffled, and wrinkly. And those happened in all replicate populations and persisted. And then we went on to later show that that diversity was synergistic, meaning each type is benefiting from growing with one another more so than it would be would have done by itself. So that's at the stage. The problem was for education, you can't put a pathogen in the classroom. And fortunately, we'd been uh, sort of paying attention 
to work ongoing with some by other colleagues of ours, like Mike Travisano and Paul Rainey, who had been studying similar processes of diversification in a safe microbe, Pseudomonas fluorescence. So then we began to ask, well, does Pseudomonas fluorescence behave the same way in our bead model? And sure enough, it does. And so I'll pause that long story to say that's, that's how the bead model got started. That's how the core of evolving STEM began. And that brought us up to sort of the late 2000s. May, may I jump in really quick sure. and point out that I, I, I actually uh, grabbed, a, grabbed a figure from the Rainey and Travisano paper where it shows the three different morphs that you get during um, a, a, a shape. Uh, well, it's actually a, a, a beaker, a tiny beaker that they put it in. You get right. the wrinkly spreaders, yep. you get the smooth morph, and you get the fuzzy spreaders. Yep. And if you look carefully at this image, again, it's the one from Rainey and Travisano, that you can see they tend to inhabit different areas of these tiny beakers. And I have to tell you, Vaughn, if I had a plate like that, I would have just put it in the red bag. Right. You know, I would have discarded it as contaminant and I would have been so wrong. This is so interesting. What I like about what you're saying is that you knew about that and then you adapted it to your bead transfer model. Right. We we knew that, I would say that we just, we developed the bead model to test a specific question about how evolution happens on surfaces, plastic surfaces yes. in particular. As a mo and also we wanted to create a an archivable system where we could capture the stages of development of adaptation to the biofilm life cycle. But then we were stunned by what we got were three different types that also inhabited different niches very clearly in our tubes, and they were involving. We later soon found afterwards the same sets of genes that make those traits as Rainey and Travisano had discovered in the Pseudomonas fluorescence system. And so marrying those two sets of discoveries was was like pretty obvious at that point. And and we've been working, yeah, working with Pseudomonas fluorescence and how it adapts um, for educational goals. And then we continue to work on Pseudomonas originosa and Burkholderia cepatia Acinobacter baumannii, some other bacteria that are pathogens for these questions related to biofilm associated infections and antimicrobial resistance. Well, I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm taken by this whole thing because everything on the website, and of course, I'm going to be linking to that yeah. in the show notes, is just has a remarkable level of thoroughness that anyone can do. Trust me, I have blunt instruments for fingers. I can get this stuff to work. And it's really good for the students in so many ways. Appreciate and that. What I, we're, I just want to point out, we're, we're actually in the middle of a big update of it too. So we hope we don't make it worse. We're going to try and make it better because we have lots more to offer to um, prospective educators and students. Well, I'll be, a, I'll be a happy beta tester in the fall. Thanks, How's Mark. that? So I did want to say it's 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 really interesting to me because there's a, a level to what you do that literally anyone with a pair of eyes can do. Yeah. And it teaches those really critical things about looking at differences and questioning what happened, along with bioinformatics down the line, and prices have come down for that sufficiently. So you can join those two concepts. Right. A lot of things we do especially with, with high schoolers or early undergraduates, uh, they don't think it's tremendously important. This is, well, and, and that's what's really exciting about it. I, I appreciate that you mentioned the bioinformatics. I'll say that that's, um, it, it's pretty advanced. I'd say that's, you know, it is rare that we get to that at the high school level, but it is really convenient for colleges as you've explored with your students and others have too. And I think that links to the broader question or broader sort of power uh, of this sort of work now. Um, you know, the best evolution is the most powerful screen. And when you do these experiments where selection is strong and the, the, the mutants are conspicuous, you are basically doing genetics because that first mutant that you pick quickly is likely caused by a single mutation. You can sequence that genome and find exactly that mutation. 
And then we uh, have sort of stood on the shoulders of other people who have built great tools to turn these into modules that allow students to you know, take the genome sequencing data that you can get from a provider at, for, a, for a, simple, you know, a low cost and, and, and you know, turn that big data into knowledge for really just a few mouse clicks. And um, I mean, it still um, sort of gives me chills to, to say it that way, even though I've been doing it since the first days of Selexa sequencing, the opportunity to, to you know, get that first, that, that, that new set of data, what's my mutant and find it is, is uh, it's just addictive. And it's interesting because if you look at the history of microbiology, so many interesting phenotypes were variable. That's right. And so what happened is that those early microbiologists, and I don't fault them for this, it's normal, yeah. they worked really hard to kind of remove that variation so they could study one thing. That's right. They were selective agents. That's right. Furthermore, the process of cultivating things is a selective agent Absolutely. as well. It, it's gotten so bad, Vaughn, that my students tend not to believe phenotypes as being natural. They'll say, oh, that's a lab phenotype. Yeah. And I can't disagree. Um. I love the point, Mark. It's a really, actually, a pretty profound point that that a lot of the foundation of microbiology selected for strains with locked phenotypes because it sort of made sense. But for those of us that that now work with wild microbes and we try to make sense of them as they bring into the lab their wild heterogeneity is um, discomforting, right? It makes us uneasy, but that's the truth. And, and so that, um, to circle back, what was actually happening in those early domestications, we were, they were selecting on traits that um, fix that phenotype range into a narrow bit that makes sense. And some of those mutations that made those changes are actually some of the most interesting. They involve these master regulators that mm -hmm. govern all sorts of cool traits. So we've kind of missed some of that, that natural variability by studying well-behaved strains. It actually was that, that sort of, I'll call it lack of charisma in Rich's ancestor, REL606 of E. coli B that motivated me to want to go work with Burkholderia, which is wildly unpredictable, as is Pseudomonas originosa for that matter. And, and uh, although it's frustrating as an experimental from time to time, it is, that's the real biology. That's what's, well, I mean, I don't have to tell you, you're the, you're sort of the, the, the leading champion of, of, uh, of loving microbial diversity. So Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I want to tell this very briefly. We have lots of things to talk about, but I just want to look at your face when I, when I tell you this. When I first learned microbiology, I learned it from a gentleman in college um, named Sid Rittenberg. He was one of the original workers with the predatory bacterium Della Vibrio. The strain that he liked was called 109J. That's the strain that I was most interested in. But what Sid had done is serially transferred it twice a week for over 20 years before a frozen stock was ever made. Look at your face. Experiment. Right. And what we don't have is the original. Uh, if we had the original, we could look at all the different changes. And, and that to me, yeah, I agree. That's my whole point. Yep. 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 Well, now you can. <laughs> now somebody else can repeat that crazy experiment. Yeah. So please tell us, tell us about how you have introduced this concept into the schools. Thanks. Yeah. So um, I sort of told an, a nice story, like it all came to be. Uh, the reality is uh, that it involved a lot of fits and starts. Uh, and the, I would say the, the, there were two key um, really sets of people that made it go at the outset. So I was a professor at the University of New Hampshire. I was trying to develop this into a curriculum that we could uh, sort of implement and study, test its efficacy. I had a, a really ambitious um, uh, master's student who was interested in science education. So she was the, the, the sort of both the brains and the muscle 
willing to try and develop this and set out the protocols and refine the 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 methodology that could that could be comprehensible in a, in a you know in a freshman biology class. And then the other um, key uh, event is that I met. Uh, well, I started talking with the father of one of my um, son's um, uh, best friends, and we were talking at the the campus pool, and he talked about his classroom, and he talked about his friend, who's also a great colleague, and at at their class at their school, who might be um, sort of bold and enterprising and willing to give it a go. And those two teachers, Mike Handwork and Shani Scarponi, along with Taylor Warren, um, my student, um, came up with a plan which uh, I think was really um, kind of audacious. They they split their they each had two classes. Uh, one class did our evolving STEM curriculum for their module on genetics and evolution, so evolution and heredity. The other did the standard curriculum, and they did that for two weeks, and then they switched them. And we measured learning outcomes uh, both after that first module and then after the switch. And what we found was that the students who uh, did Evolving STEM first learned about 50% more on a common mm. uh, set of assessments than the standard curriculum. And then when they swapped, those who got evolving STEM caught up. And so by the end of that sort of four weeks, there was no statistical difference between the two groups. But you could see that if you just did evolving STEM, you would, you would learn more on that material. And then the following year, we added a survey on sentiments towards careers and uh, future coursework in STEM. And we found significant gains in their in in student um, motivation and attitudes towards topics in STEM, uh, and we did that with now not just those that school but with four other schools in in the New ha in uh, sort of the New Hampshire Seacoast region, and so that's when we knew we we had really sort of stumbled onto something right that that not only was this a great pilot. It was something that um, I've later been told by science educators is a narrow intervention in the sense that it's short and focused. And yet the process of doing science and seeing evolution and doing microbiology with your hands changes them and gives them a sense of agency in science and encourages them, many of them, particularly girls, by the way, to do more. So we'd see greater gains in, in, in attitudes among girls than boys on average. Um, fast forward, I moved to the University of Pittsburgh and all the way up to today, um, thanks to amazing work by Abby Mattella, Dr. Abigail Mattella, who's our director of, of the Evolving STEM program here in Pittsburgh. Um, we've just now um, worked with our 5,000th student we're in more than 20 active schools with 40 active classrooms. We're also in about 15 colleges and universities. Um, it's the most important work we do by a country mile. It's just amazing. Thanks. And, and, it, and it, like I said, it really, there's no substitute, none for a student finding something and they they did that. That's and right. that's so different than the way that biology is so often taught. I, I'm not trying to throw shade at anybody for the way that things are taught previously. Uh, look at the the uh, the success of cures, uh, course-based undergraduate research experiences that take place. I know how well they work and obviously so do uh, you. Well, so this is a bunch of them. <laughs> so many of them, yeah. So could you walk the listeners and viewers through an experiment that the students do so they'll get a sense of what the students are seeing? Sure, glad to. Um, well, first I wanna say before we ever get to the students, uh, we've learned unsurprisingly that you really need a fearless, 
teacher. And if they're not fearless, we need a teacher who's willing to be challenged and then may become confident enough to run the classroom using an experiment where they don't actually know what's going to happen. Because that's, that's, that, that's, that's biological research, right? You don't know what's going to happen, especially if the outcome is evolution, right? Which is acting on, on random, randomly arising variation. So once we've got that awesome teacher who's willing to, to go along with us on the ride, um, they get a box that we deliver. And usually in the first go, we co-teach with the teacher. So we're basically like acting as super TAs. And students usually of groups of three or four um, start with uh, uh, a little kit where they have uh, beads and tubes and media, and uh, they will uh, add uh, bacteria to those growth tubes. And some of those tubes will have a bead, and one of those tubes will not have a bead, and that is sort of your control. And then they'll start that all on a Monday. They'll do a transfer from Monday to Tuesday, Tuesday to Wednesday, Wednesday to Thursday. And then they will plate, usually on Tuesday, which is just to represent where they started, and on Friday, which is to represent what happened at the end. And more cases than not, that population just over that week has diversified. And they can see that when they come in on Monday after plating on Friday, they look at their plates and they compare. Their Tuesday plates and their Friday plates, there's no variation on the Tuesday plate. And on the Friday plate, if they're lucky, they've got wrinkly colonies, they've got maybe fuzzy colonies, and then they've got the smooth colonies. And that's evolution in action. You know, so the students will see the, the diversity on the, and the teachers will see the diversity on the plates, and they'll wonder how does this connect to this module that they typically get in their classrooms, usually involving long periods of time and Darwin's finches or something like that. And, and you know, I love those examples, but that's where um, the, the sort of historical aspects, uh, basis of evolution by natural selection fails to, to sort of convey how much of an active process uh, evolution can be. And so what we usually do then is talk about the number of bacteria that are actually in that tube. I always ask this to so say, hey, hey, I come up to a student and say, how many cells do you think are in your, in your tube there or on, that, on your plate? And they usually say, oh, a million. And I say, how about 10 billion? How about more cells of bacteria are on your plate or in your tube than there are humans on the planet? And that all of the bacteria in this classroom are more individual cells than, ha than all of the humans that have ever existed. And that, at that amount of growth has happened just really overnight. And so then we start to talk about how, you know, not every cell division makes a perfect copy of uh, that parent bacteria and that mutations happen at random. And while most of those mutations are neutral or harmful, some tiny fraction of them are beneficial. They help the bacteria do something better and grow better. And what we're doing is we're selecting for the stickiest of them. And uh, when you have a really big, big population and lots of cell division, selection is super strong. And so the, the, the mutants that make the stickiest uh, colonies or, or clusters are often the ones in that wisp path that we were talking about which make these wrinkly spreaders. And those work by um, basically locking the cell into thinking that it's always on a surface. So the cell thinks it's actually being kind of always jammed up against a surface. So it's causing little depressions, they think, in the paraplasm, the two membranes on gram-negative bacteria. And then that's transducing a signal uh, through that elaborate antenna that makes uh, uh, leads to the synthesis of a molecule called cyclic DiGMP. And I have that, that system uh, uh, described on my uh, slide there, slide 33 that I shared with you. These mutations occur in primarily in three pathways that make these uh, sticky or, or, or more slimy variants. 
all by upregulating this signaling molecule that governs the stick or swim pathway. So we've gone from very basic concepts in how evolution by natural selection works to the understanding that mutations are selected, those are heritable. Those heritable base pair changes change a protein that changes a signal that makes them sticky. And so depending on how kind of fluent the teacher is and how ambitious they are, they can get the students up to sort of a working, you know, introductory or even middle tier college genetics level, this understanding of, of heredity. And it's, it's awesome. Or cell biology or bacteriology or whatever. And, and and just again to reiterate, I mean, here's a situation depending on on levels of of expertise, where a student finds a variant, is able to find out what's different about that variant, compare that variant to the other similar mutations, and right. be able to say, oh, it's a type one mutant. That's right. And that's so powerful for students to see. That's right. And sometimes students discover new ones. So, for instance, uh, you know, the famous science journalist. Carl Zimmer gave Evolving STEM a try um, in collaborate with the help of Paul Turner's lab at Yale, actually during the pandemic when he was writing his book. And he discovered uh, a new set of mutants. He discovered a, a mutant that gave rise to sort of a different fuzzy, different fuzz Y mutant. And then we also had a mutant um, that affects the formation of disulfide bonds in in proteins and we think that that's playing into the sensing of misfolding in the periplasm so these mutants are basically also sort of signaling to the cell something's wrong something's like disordered in this periplasmic space and then that that in turn also transduces to make this sticky uh sticky cell through this formation of cellulose and this approach, which is a wonderful system, can be applied in so many different ways. You've already mentioned the predatory assay. Yeah. Something, something that I've played with a little bit are slow swimmers and fast swimmers. Yep. And I'm, I'm going to be sending some of those materials in for, for sequencing to see right what's on. changed. Yeah. There's a lot of opportunity for inquiry, right? So we, we do want teachers when they can of all kinds to give the students agency in designing a follow-up experiment that allows them to riff on the basics and that's even easier now with when you've got the predator right because they can think about they can sort of visualize um sort of defense areas or ways that challenge the the predator migrating across the bacteria but you can also evolve on different surfaces you know we use a simple seven millimeter plastic bead but others have used slides, others have used metal, others have used, um, uh, you know, t tube material like silicone. So, yeah, we, we, we encourage, you know, we encourage creativity like, like, like you have. What I really appreciate about your program is that there are a number of different changes that take place. These master regulators that you're talking about. Right. And can you say a few words about the wrinkly spreaders and the fact that they form a mat? Yeah, I, I'd love to. So uh, the wrinklies were characterized, as you said, by, um, by the Rainy Lab as uh, adapted to, the air, to forming a biofilm on the air-liquid interface, sort of forming what they call a pellicle biofilm. So they're making a mat that allows them to spread out along the the surface of the media, and they're doing so because they're getting sort of preferred access to oxygen. Now, our evolving stem model actually is on beads that are often being shaken. The wrinklies are also uh, adapted to stick on other surfaces like the plastic bead. And so we find, for instance, that the wrinklies are good at sticking to the bead. They're also good at forming biofilm along the air-liquid interface of the tube, but since it's being agitated, they're basically making a bathtub ring, right? They're sticking along the, the edges of the tube. Now, those cells on the bathtub ring don't make it to the next round, but those that stick to the bead and are lucky to maybe grab on as you move the bead from, from, from tube to tube, 
do make it. And those are often uh, those are often um, mutants that uh, that are producing more biofilm, and the wrinkly sort of the wisp pathway mutants of the wisp pathway, which make those wrinkly variants, are among the best at that. I could go on though. I mean, there are some major trade offs. The wrinklies grow slower, for instance, and so um, while it's great for them to make this this trip from bead to bead, they're also paying a cost because they're producing more slime and growing slower as a consequence. So I, I know that you won't see this with the bead system, but I have personally seen the mats form and then they sink That's over right. time. Within the mats, you're getting cheaters right. that aren't expending energy to make the exopolysaccharide, which I think is cellulose, is it, it is not? cellulose. That's right. And so and in fact, when we grow up those, when we ask the students, well, what's next? You know, so a, a, some classrooms will say, okay, now they've seen evolution, what happens? Well, if you passage those wrinkly to wrinkly colonies just overnight, you'll get suppressor mutants. You'll get mutants of the wrinkly that sort of undo that relatively costly phenotype. You get a, a, a mixed culture the next time of smooths, which are uh, a mutant of the wrinkly and then the wrinkly itself um, because it's, it's costly amazing. and um, uh, and there's, yeah, we go on. There's more details there too. So the deeply cool thing about this, which maybe doesn't apply so much to middle school or high school is that then it's possible to get these variants, which are again, identified by even a beginning student yeah. based on their difference on a plate. That's right. And it's possible for a relatively modest amount of money, surprisingly low, mm. incidentally, yeah. I know, and thank you, sure. um, to, to be able to get genomic DNA made and then use bioinformatics to find out what has changed among all of the genes in that organism, something I never dreamed would be possible. Right. Yeah, it's amazing. You can, I mean, these students and you can use a system like this to basically you allow evolution to do genetics for you. Yeah, and so yeah. We're, we're continuing to do that. Um, in particular, we're interested in how the mixture of all of those mutants changes uh, their resilience to something like, say, a predator. So this is the gateway to the middle schools now, and this actually came up um, in my basement with my own seventh grader, one year ago, and now it's in many, many middle, middle schools, probably up to a thousand students will see it this year, which is amazing. But um, a great predator is the slime mold Dictyostelium discoidium. And so it's a social amoeba and they, they get together and they, they eat in groups. Uh, well, actually they eat as solos and they later form groups once they get hungry. Um, those predatory amoeba love to eat things like bacteria, including Pseudomonas fluorescence. And we, my son Harlan and I, had this idea that maybe these biofilm mutants might do a better job of defending against predation. And so that was Harlan's middle school science project. And sure enough, they do. And you can measure that just as how the, the dicty eats out across a lawn of your mutant. But now we're testing whether if you mix those different types together, does that mixture defend cooperatively better than any of the ones individually do alone? And so the, to just punchline, the wrinklies are great at defending against predation. Wisp, wisp mutants uh, are, are excellent at defending against predation. The wild type and some of the other biofilm mutants are actually more tasty effectively to the to the dicti bacteria. And so this is the research. And so then we can have dicti be the agent of selection. That's where we're headed with some of our research that is now kind of uh, sort of standing on the shoulders of all of our middle school and high school students. And then they in turn will be um, helping us drive some of that forward. So where do you see, where do you see the work in 10 years time? <laughs> um, I love this question. Uh, we are getting close, I believe, to being formally adopted by Pittsburgh Public Schools, which is uh, the second biggest school district in the state of Pennsylvania and predominantly minority serving. 
And once we've gotten that level of, um, of district level adoption, we'll move on to other districts. And in addition, and I, you know, I mean, I think other districts like Pittsburgh are key. We've got a key partner, for instance, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Others in, in the Atlanta area have been doing great work with some of those, those uh, schools. In 10 years, I would think that we are doing more with more refined curriculums that, that span middle schools and high schools for tens of thousands of students a year. So what this tells you is the title, Evolution for All. That's right. Is really, really relevant. Yeah. Yeah. That's the goal. So normally, uh, at the end of, of these interviews, I, I, I ask uh, the guest what one particular experience sold them as being a microbiologist, but you've already explained that with baculoviruses, I, I, which, are, yeah. which are beautiful. I, I, I did. I I. I mean, again, um, we're all lucky to be doing this kind of work. I, I, I know we're, we're kindred spirits that way. Um, I think that the, 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 the tangible changes that I was able to see in my early days of microbiology, the, the tangible change was these viruses kill the insects faster. These ones kill them slower and they do things differently. That was like obvious. I couldn't, you didn't need statistics. I mean, we used them later, but you didn't need them to see the differences. Um, and then likewise with these, with these bacterial evolution experiments on surfaces, you know, it's not just changes in frequencies of mutants, it's changes in frequencies of things that you can see with traits that are conspicuous. There's a lot of science that is as or more powerful and important that doesn't have that visible readout. And I think um, the more we can develop tools to turn those amazing studies into visual sort of changes in real time, the more scientists we will make, right? And that's ultimately what we need. We need, we need to all do a lot of work together um, many hands like make light work to share the wonder of science because not to end on a downer, science has been under attack and we all need to lend a hand to, to, to share with our friends and colleagues how important it is. And you know, it's interesting to note that we're all scientists right. inside, every one of us, and it's carefully not encouraged. And what you've suggested here is a way to really kindle that spark in people from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, science for everyone, evolution for everyone. And it has been just an honor speaking to you today on this great topic. And I can't wait to see the new iteration you're working on, by the way. Thanks, thanks hint, Mark. Hint. Yeah, I mean, we've already sort of got the preview in your head. It's, it's, it's these awesome Dixie projects and just the miniaturization of our kits that allow for a lot lot uh a lot easier distribution to all but yeah as you say the the more we can sort of demystify and demystify science and make it more accessible the more colleagues w that we we will have to help us make the kind of discoveries we need that's right well i want to thank you again for appearing on the podcast vaughn and as always my very best wishes to you and your family my, back to you as well this has been Matters Microbial, a weekly podcast about the wonders of microbiology and the people who study it. You can send questions, comments, or suggestions to me at mattersmicrobial at gmail.com. Show notes from today's episode, with as usual awesome beyond words links, can be found at microbe.tv slash mm. If you like our work, please consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash mm. I'm Doc Martin, and you can find me in the biology department of the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Vaughn Cooper can be found in the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Evolution at the University of Pittsburgh. Many, many thanks to David Renata for superb editing and to Reber Clark for the wonderfully quirky music. I hope you've enjoyed being part of our Quality Quorum today. 
See you next week on Matters Microbial.